a ban on tobacco in the U.S., while a noble attempt at a better future is flawed, and if passed, will one, infringe on our personal freedom, two, only put further strain on the economy, three, increase an already high disrespect for the law. Okay. Um, people have the right to smoke, just like they have the right to eat Big Macs until their hearts give out. As Benjamin Franklin once said, those who desire to give up freedom and achieve security deserve neither. It's called education. It comes from our teachers and more importantly, our parents. It's the job of every parent to warn their children of the dangers of the world, including cigarettes, so that one day when they get older, they can choose for themselves. There will always be leading preventable causes for death, and eventually, things will just if the government decides to take those away as well, well, we'll have our right to bear arms taken away. After that, our favorite unnutritional foods. And after that, you might just find yourself, find, just find yourself, buying hard, just might find yourself a hard time trying to buy simple Tylenol and contraceptives on the grounds that we're too stupid to know the risks that we incur through the use of these things. On the other hand, the tobacco industry also creates thousands of jobs. According to the North Carolina Agriculture Commissioner, Steve Troxler, tobacco is responsible for the creation of 10,000 jobs, which on average pay $86,000, more than double the $39,000 which the average citizen of North Carolina could get. If tobacco were passed, not only would 10,000 people be out on the street, but on top of that, we would still have to pay for health care costs. Also, the U.S. cannot afford to get rid of all the tobacco which is already within the country. Say the ban passes. Hundreds of, convenience, hundreds of thousands of convenience stores which sell tobacco products won't just decide to throw out half their inventory. The U.S. is going to have to buy these toba this tobacco at a much higher price than the market price if they intend to get rid of most of it. On top of that, I don't know how I don't know what sort of punishment will be involved for infringing on the tobacco ban. As it is, our jails are already overcrowded establishments. In fact, about one and a half one and a half million people are behind bars in the U.S. And the correctional population is measured at 7.3 million. That's one in 31 people. Is America really ready to compound that number with the 45 million current smokers in the U.S.? As it is, the U.S. spends $60 billion just housing inmates. This does not account the cost of parole or probation. The cost incurred by massive increase in the correctional system, the need to buy and the need to buy all the cigarettes which are currently in the U.S., and the loss of all the money which, baked, which is made from tobacco will likely cost the country hundreds of billions of dollars. I'm going to write $100 billion. <laughs> <laughs> hundred, zero, 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 that's 100,000. There's a hundred million. There is a hundred <laughs> billion dollars which you just lost. <laughs> Hundreds of billions of dollars will be lost by banning tobacco. Respect for the law will also diminish, as shown by the example set forth by Prohibition. In case you forgot what Prohibition was, I'll provide a crash course in Bad Ideas 101. The Volstead Act, the popular name for the National Prohibition Act, passed through Congress over President Woodrow Wilson's veto on October 28, 1919, and established a legal definition of intoxicating liquor. Though the Volstead Act prohibited the sale of liquor, it did little to enforce the law. The illegal production and distribution of liquor or bootlegging became rampant, and national government did not have the means or desire to enforce every border, every lake, every city, and every speakeasy in America. In fact, by 1925, 
just six years later, New York City alone had anywhere from 30,000 to 100,000 speakeasy clubs. Prohibition became increasingly unpopular during the Great Depression, Depression, especially in large cities. On March 1923, 1933, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt signed into law an amendment to repeal um, an amendment known as the Cullen Harrison Act, allowing the manufacture of certain kinds of alcoholic beverages. In 1933, December 5th, the 21st Amendment repealed the 18th. The effects of prohibition were largely unanticipated. Production, importation, and distribution of alcoholic beverages, once the province of legitimate business, were taken over by criminal gangs which fought each other for control in violent, con violent confrontation, including mass murder. Major gangsters such as Omaha's tennis Tom Dennison and Chicago's Al Capone became rich and were admired locally and nationally. Enforcement was difficult because gangs became so rich they were able to bribe underpaid and understaffed enforcement. Many citizens were sympathetic to bootleggers. Respectable citizens were lured to the romance of illegal speakeasies and also called blind pigs. Those inclined to help authorities were often intimidated, even murdered. In several major cities that served as major points for liquor importation, Gangs wielded significant political power. A Michigan State Police raid on Detroit's Du Howe once netted the mayor, the sheriff, and a local congressman, both all participating in the speakeasy. How would you feel if the police that were arresting you for smoking then turned around and stopped for one themselves later? It just doesn't make sense. <laughs> 